The software upgrade will be written and rolled out in three months. I don't know how to do Dilbert's voice. He actually has a TV show. And then the project is this complex and ever been completed by the estimated finish date? No, we're confident we're going to be the first. Is that because he's doing anything differently from those who failed? No, we're doing exactly the same way as the people who failed. You see what I'm getting at? No. <laughs> we're good. And we're going to be on budget, too. Historic. <laughs> <laughs> and they're not going to change the uh, the targets when you turn it in for the first run. Pretty much. So Kyle showed this to me earlier, and I tweeted it out as Einstein's insanity test. Doing the same thing over and over again. Expecting a different result. This is so. What Kyle and Derek and I do is a technology called data virtualization. Um, not that difficult, I hope, to explain. You know, you've got server virtualization companies like VMware and such. They'll take CPU and RAM resources and they'll give you a virtual machine a lot faster. But all those virtual machines. They need a full image of storage. They need a full set of file systems, databases, app stacks, the whole thing. Uh, we virtualize storage. So this is for data virtualization. These are some of the companies that are using data virtualization. And they use that not just to save space, but really to kind of increase the pace at which they're able to do development. I mean, as we're going to mention later on, one of the biggest constraints to Agile development and, and continuous integration is the availability of environments in which you can work. So these folks achieve a, a 2x speed up in, in their, uh, on average, in their applications. And there are a variety of different uh, organizations, NASA for the government, McDonald's for retail, Costco, Facebook. Um, you have to sit there and ask yourself, you know, what could I do with a 2x speed up on, on my my application development and my testing, what would happen if my competitor had the 2x speed up that I didn't? So the upshot is, you know, what do these com what do these companies realize that maybe we haven't? So, so what what excites me about this is the DevOps movement. Because as opposed to most people I meet, and this is constantly over and over in the industry, is like, you know, hey I've got a better way of doing something. Are you interested? And like, no, 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 I'm busy. <laughs> So, I mean, are you too busy to innovate? So two weeks ago, I went to the Enterprise uh, DevOps Summit. And I, I mean, I met a lot of companies, Barclays, Target, Macy's. Uh, even the one that person the most was the CIO of the uh, Department of Human Services in the government. He's bringing Agile into the government. I'm like, that yeah. sounds impossible. Yeah. But he's doing it, and he's pretty excited about it. So I'm really happy to see people changing these old quagmires out there. Something different. So we talked about this a little at the beginning before we started. What is DevOps? I think the simplest definition is it's tools versus culture. And then in culture, what do we want? We want to bridge the silos mainly between development and ops. Um, but we want to create empathy and collaboration have, and, and stop blaming or avoid blame. But it's going to take tools. What One of the primary goals of tools is automating things, getting the human steps out of it, um, be able to measure, get feedback, what's working well, what's not. And then self-service, empowering like empowering developers to do things that it doesn't have to ask the uh, operations guys for. But sort of the meta DevOps, and I'm more into pragmatic as I mentioned. I like to know what tools do and why they work and why they don't work. But the uh, the goal is something bigger. It's not just the tools and cultures. Look at what DevOps is bringing people. Look at what people are doing and go for that. So DevOps is basically optimizing the flow from dev to ops to production. But the real goal, the bottom goal, is we have companies. We want, the, we want to improve the bottom line of the company. That's the real goal, and that's the thing that's important to keep in mind. Not just what tool is it, or what agile scrum burn down methods people are using. So now I'm going to start talking about approaches to problems. So how many people have heard of the goal? Read the goal. How many people read the goal? Nobody's read it? It's a good read, yeah. but we'll talk about it. But Listen to it on your headphones as you're going to sleep. 
I don't have time to read anymore, but I'm listening to everything on Audible now. But the goal is basically a fictional story. There's characters who live through these life events. But the point of the goal is to talk about the theory of constraints. And so the theory of constraints is any improvement that's not made at the constraint is an illusion. Now, I don't know, when I first heard that, I thought that sounded obvious. But, uh, and this was applied to factory floor automation. Did you hear about the Phoenix Project? Yeah. Okay, so we'll get into that. Right, coming up. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm, I'm a computer guy. You know, I'm like, computer programs are crazy. Uh, operations is crazy. Uh, this is factory floor automation. But if I had a factory and we have these orders coming in and I'm not able to produce the orders fast enough to satisfy my sales, and I'm the factory foreman, and I've got, I see these guys kicking back at some of the stations and they're not producing... I'm like, get to work. Everybody should be working 100%. And I'd be going around the factory making sure everybody's working really hard. Well, the theory of constraints, what's surprising is that's not a good thing to do. So say we have a, we're, we're making pipes. We start from resin, raw material, and we go out to shipping it. So the leak detection station is actually the bottleneck, the constraint, the slowest point in that factory floor. If we tune before the constraint, then I'm going to get a stockpile of stuff that I have to manage. It's going to take me extra energy to manage it, piling up before the constraint. Got to store inventory systems. If I tune after the constraint, I'm telling you guys work faster, work faster. They're starved. They don't have product to work on. So what we need to do is find that constraint and optimize that constraint. That's the only thing that's going to serve us. So that's factories. I thought, well, that makes sense. Factory floor, you're going from A to B. What about IT? IT is like herding cats, man. There's stuff coming in from 360 degrees. I'm like, could you actually apply? Could we actually apply that to IT? And that's what the Phoenix Project comes in. It takes an IT uh, group who has all these problems, a company that's like losing on the stock market, their competitors winning, producing new features for their web pages that they couldn't do, and it applies the same theory of constraints to it, and it actually works. And it's, so, if you haven't read it, I highly recommend. The goal is probably more drier. This thing, if you read this, a lot of people read it. If it works in IT, like I couldn't read it because I was sweating. It was too real. I was like, so much like work, I couldn't read it. <laughs> they're, both, they're both excellent novelizations. I mean, you've got, you know, intrigue, politics, sex, everything like that. You know, all that in with a textbook. It's kind of rare. I missed the sex part. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I think Work with me here. <laughs> so just to summarize the uh, Phoenix Project, basically one of the things he does is he goes through, the main character goes through and talks to the different departments and finds out, what are the goals of the department? And what's the goal of the company? And gets so he can get his operation teams in alignment with what's actually going to help the company the best. And then once he has the goals defined, he goes through and collects metrics. What metrics will tell them whether they're on track or off track? With those metrics, he can use the metrics to identify where are the constraints in operations. Once we identify the constraints, we can set priorities. We want to attack those constraints first. And using the metrics, we can see if we're on target or off target. We want to iterate fast so we can get closer and closer to being on target. Now, it's really cool in the book. He doesn't use much of the, he doesn't use the, the buzz terms in the industry. He doesn't say agile. He doesn't say continuous integration. He doesn't say Kanban. I don't think he uses any of those terms. But he goes through the process of using, which is better. That's what we really care about. So he does talk about continuous integration using the cloud, agile, Kanban, and product. And the author of the book, well, there's multiple authors, but the main author said IT is the factory floor of the century. So if the, if, if the only thing that matters is tuning the, the constraint, well, what is the constraint in IT? Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> so what is that constraint? And the author of the book, Gene Kim, said the top five constraints in IT from main, most important constraint to least important constraint are first, building development environments and development environments set up. Second, building QA environments. And he says one of the most powerful things organizations can do is to enable development and testing to get environments they need when they need it. And a recent CIO magazine survey found that over 6% of projects are over budget and over scheduled. Surprise, surprise. Of those over budget and over scheduled, 85% of them were delayed because they were waiting for data and environments. And it's only getting worse. Gartner did a study and they predicted data doomsday by 2017. They expect one third of IT departments will go through a crisis where they can't handle their workload. So what's in this presentation? We'll talk about data being the constraint. Why is data the constraint? What are the impacts? Find a solution. 
how can we solve this problem, and then we'll look at use cases. What would happen when we have the solution? So first, data is constraint. So moving data is hard, and the backbone of most applications is some sort of database. Probably the bigger the company is, the bigger those databases are. Actually providing copies of those, that data for development and QA, UAT, uh, it's a lot of work. It takes storage and systems and personnel and time. It's not just, not just databases, it's app stacks, application stacks, file systems, etc. Just massive amounts of data and every byte has to be moved. Yeah. And the interesting thing is, even if I had all the storage, all the systems in the world, it would still take me time, and all the personnel. I still take me time to make copies of this stuff. So here's the typical architecture we see. We have some production system, usually hooked up to the database. The database is usually the biggest chunk of data. And we have to, first of all, we have to back it up. So we have some guys, you know, develop, DBA guys, storage guy, backing this thing up. Then we have reporting, so people can run, run a business analysis, business intelligence reports on it. And then we come in to where we are, which is development. And the development's gonna take a lot of copies. We need development copies for the development team, probably multiple copies, copies for QA, ideally multiple copies of QA, UAT, and integration. How many environments do you have, dev environments, non-production environments, that are supporting your production? At your shop, to your site? Uh, okay, I asked that question. The last one I worked at, like yeah, that's a that's that's a right number, and that indicates that you've started down the road on, on agile and DevOps. But for a shop that is totally up against the wall, I mean, a dozen is not unusual, or even a half a dozen. Some of them, are, you know, really bottom. Um, did uh, I was in, a couple of months ago during the summer? I asked that question. And someone pops up his head and says 110. And everyone's, everyone's turned and looked at him. He's like, hey, man, you know, we believe in this stuff. That's how many we have. So we have to have it. You know, everyone has their own environment to work with. And that's the optimal way to do this, is not to share environments, not to only refresh on, on occasion. So. so they believe in continuous integration? They, yeah, that, that's pretty much what he's saying. And then to refresh all these copies, it stresses infrastructure. You gotta copy all this data across the networks. One, one military branch we talked to, they said basically at 5 p.m. on Friday, you gotta get out of the office because it's gonna be, the network's clogged up all weekend. I think better be good. Nobody better attack us uh, yeah, on exactly. Everyone's gonna have to sign up. <laughs> <laughs> Not to attack the US. And so this data floods infrastructure. Um, interesting report from the Wall Street Trade Association, 92% uh, of the business cost in like when we do uh, stock trading, arbitrage, is all data. That's a lot of the cost of the business. Now in brick and mortar, uh, average IT spending is like 5% of the company's budget. But other than about a half of it's on data. And that data is getting bigger. So this is where it's hitting the bottom line of the company. Remember the goal, our whole goal really as people in a company is how do we improve the bottom line of the company? So this data constraints hitting in four areas. So IT capital resources, personnel, application development, and then the business. So of course to have all those all those these copies, it's gonna take hardware. It's gonna take storage, network, data center floor space, cooling, conducting a lot of Revenue, and there's never enough environments. And one of the classic stories is here in the state of Colorado. The, this, the legislature signed off on a hundred hundred projects, but at the time we started working with them, they only had enough infrastructure for three of those projects. We get a bottleneck on projects, and then the operations. This takes thousands of hours of people time. Talking to companies. I mean, I'm a D, I come from a DBA background, so I talk to DBAs. At the Fortune 2000 companies, it's typically thousands of hours a year of DBA work just making copies. I'm not talking about maintaining the schema or performance or anything else that DBA does, just copying the data. And then that goes across all these other groups. And also, if we want to do something like data center modernization or migration, moving all that data is going to run in typically tens of millions of dollars. I was working at the state of Colorado recently on the SAP <coughs> um, methods. And at the moment, they have 
uh, process that they've documented in, in Excel that has about 150 steps. 20 of those steps involve copying data, whether it's making a safety backup or copying it or moving it, you know, just 20 of those steps. And if you look at each one of those 150 steps by duration, those 20 steps are the ones that stand tall in terms of a bar graph showing the amount of time. It's, it, it, it's a long, complicated process. You have to protect yourself against any missteps so that you can fall back to a previous step without having to go all the way back to step one. Uh, 150 steps to, you know, to, to clone an environment, and that's just the average. What's that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely a good step, yeah. But right now it's Excel. <laughs> How many people are using Puppet and Chef? Everyone? Is it, no? Are you guys using automated, automation tools like that? If, you know, we're working on getting that. But we're, we kind of hit that level where we're starting to go, oh, we got to start automating things. Right. Or rather, we knew it, imagine we right. started to realize it. Right. I think that's one of the big things about DevOps. It takes executive buying, really. Yeah. Like, some because it's an investment. And, and if you ask somebody about those 150 steps, they'll say, well, each one of them is scripted. It's automated. Now we're into our orchestration. It's not just scripted. So we talked about uh, ca uh, capital resources, operational resources, and now it's hitting application development because we can't get the environments we need. And that's going to impact us in some ways I'll talk about more later. But uh, it's going to be high cost of QA, inefficient QA. Um, Sharing in environments between developers because they can't get enough, slowing down how fast they can code. Uh, trying to get workarounds like using subsets of data, which ends up running into bugs. And just waiting for environments and slowing down development in general. And then finally, it's hitting the business's bottom line because if the business can't get this data, then the business is going to make decisions that are not well founded. Um, for example, if I'm like Walmart and like the Batman's new Batman toy sells out on the East Coast in the morning, I want to know that for the other stores across the nation to be able to vision quickly. So the older the data, the less intelligence our businesses have. And then what I think is the most surprising is this problem that we've been stepping through here, <coughs> most companies I talk to aren't aware of it. And if they are aware of it, they're like, well, that's just life. I mean, it takes data is big, it takes a lot to copy of it, that's we just have to live with it. We've been doing this for years. It's always worked. We also have the best IT department in the nation, and it's there could be nothing better. <laughs> but they don't necessarily know what's going on. <laughs> if, if I'm a developer and I ask, for, I, okay, well, first of all, I'm not going to ask for an environment. But, if I, but the reason is because I've already done it at some point in my career and I know what the response is, I'm not going to get it. So if I have some specialized project or a bug I need to analyze that's, that, was, that I saw in production, I can't get an environment to look at it. If I'm a business analyst and I don't already have a copy, I'm not going to get a new copy because it doesn't already exist. So the company higher up doesn't know what's needed by the company because they don't care about it. I like to go into companies and, and um, ask for metrics. So well, the one I love the most is like, we'll go into, there are solutions to this, right? So what if you could get that database in two minutes, point and click in a web browser? And the guy's like, uh, like CIO, like, we already do that. So I'm like, really? Okay, if I ask a developer, I ask how, if he asks for a copy of the environment, how long would it take to get it? What would he say? That's the real question. Odds are, is it going to be a no? And if it does get a yes, it's usually going to be in, measured in the weeks. And then, in like even in development or Q, mostly QA, how old is the data? I mean, usually if I have a big crowd, I ask them everybody to stand up and like everybody who's weak, whose data is like a week or, or newer, sit down. We'll keep going. We'll reach into multi years of data age because it doesn't get refreshed. <coughs> and then, how much storage is all this copying taking up? And then other parts of the business, how old is data for business analyst? Is it one day old, one week old? How old is it? If you have an audit, Starbucks Oxy or Dodd Frank, CCAR, how can you actually get a copy of the data when they're asking for it? And if you can, how long would it take to get it? So what are some of the problems this causes? I hit on these a little bit, but it's going to cause the bottlenecks. We don't have enough environments. Uh, it's going to slow down getting projects started. We have to wait to get these environments. It's going to slow down the developers because they're going to share copies so they can't code as fast as they want. It's going to cause bugs in production. We can't test as much as we want. And QA in general is going to be slow <coughs> and expensive. 
So we've talked about this already. If I have a new project coming into the company, we have a limited amount, limited amount of available resources. It's going to definitely hit a bottleneck. If I have a new project, I've got these, and I got the developers lined up. They're ready to go, but I've got to build all the environments for them. The typical time I hear starting a brand new important project is about three weeks to get environment set up. And a lot of people are like upper level management. It's like, oh well, they're working on stuff. Well, I'm sure they are, but I mean, you might be watching kitten videos on the YouTube. I don't know how productive they're going to be. Once we get them up and running, and I've seen this at big companies like eBay, we'll have a bunch of developers working on one copy of the environment, especially one back-end database. Like, well, what if somebody wants to make a schema change or add metadata? What do they do? Well, like, oh, well, yeah, they have to have a code review. Like, okay, how long does that take? This is eBay, one to two weeks. I'm like, if I'm a developer and you're telling me I've got to wait one to two weeks to get that schema change to write the code that I need to write, I may kill my motivation. And then as we mentioned, if all these people are sharing one resource, how, how often is it going to get refreshed? It's going to be pretty rare. It's going to be tough to get everybody off. It takes a few days to refresh it. Nobody wants to be off of that long. It just doesn't happen. So what do people do? They, a lot of people go to a subset. So instead of either maybe a synthetic schema where it's not the real production data, or they take the production data and try to slice up into smaller bits. Um, well, what happens when developers work on these subsets or synthetic schemas and then QA QAs on it? We hit what's called production wall. We have we see new data that we've never seen before, never tested against. We see data quantities we've never tested against. And then what happens to the operation guys? <laughs> developers like it worked for me. It must be an operations problem. And then one of the biggest problems I see is QA. Um, one of the customers we talked to, they spent of their QA cycles, they spent 96% of the QA cycle building the environment, running destructive QA tests, and they rebuild the QA environment. And this is a cycle that just runs over and over again. And because it takes a while to build an environment, if a bug gets into the code, it's longer before we find it. And the longer it takes to find it, the more dependent code gets written on top of it, the more work I have to do to fix that bug. Ideally, we want to find a bug as soon as we can. And so this probably should be preaching the choir here. I imagine preaching the choir, but um, this dev app, the DevOps possibly even with these data problems, but I think the allure is very intriguing. So on the top, I've got a guy who's like on a mammoth wave trying to serve his expert on Windsor. Actually, I met this guy in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah. Are you took that picture? I didn't take the picture, but I met the guy. Um, but if I have one release a year, it's just going to be a big mammoth thing, and I haven't been trained that well, I'm going to get clobbered. And this happens over and over again. And my idea of Agile and continuous integration is we're doing integration all the time. There are small integrations, and also we build up like the muscle and ability of the uh, dexterity because we've been doing it all the time. Yeah. So water versus Agile. The idea is, my, in my experience, I, mean, I used to work at Oracle, we worked with the waterfall shop. How many times has Oracle ever met a release date this is going to do? So we set up these big massive specs, we work for a few years at Oracle, and we find out, whoa, we're way off path, but we've got to release it soon, try to get back on path, try to figure out the bugs, and we screw up somehow. I mean, we're missing that huge bug, or we're missing features that we want. The idea of Agile, I with the Agile company, we have two week scrums, we have burn down rate, and we didn't hide in the group I was in on my project, we never missed a date, which is pretty cool for me. So we might go off course, we have a, a runnable version, like at least run it in-house, and then we get back on path to keep these small cycles going. And if we're doing continuous integration, we're finding the bugs as we go. If we're doing waterfall, we'll, we'll start testing with Agile and continuous integration, we'll start testing right away, start finding bugs right away, and we keep putting up on top of it at Oracle. Well, there wouldn't be much code to test in the beginning. Once we get near release dates, then we start running some serious testing. We find we get overwhelmed by the number of bugs we find. Now, this might not apply to everybody, but if I'm running small agile um, and I have usable code early on, I can start, with, especially a shop like uh, Google or Facebook or Flickr, you know, they can start monetizing that functionality right away. If I'm in waterfall, I can't monetize it to the very end until it's actually done. And then, as far as release code, and the, in continuous integration, I'm testing all the time. So, my whatever release cost I have stays pretty constant. 
uh, the waterfall, if I want to release it once at the very end, the longer that project goes on, the more work I have, the harder and more expensive it's going to be to actually do that release. But when it comes to these big data, where I, I can only have a limited number of uh, environments and it takes so long to create environments, is this is continuous integration where we're testing maybe multiple times a day? Is that even possible? If creating one copy feels like that. Well, now I'll talk about what's the solution. If I'm creating these copies over and over again, in general, especially, I mean, my experience with databases, in general, across all those copies, across the different environments, 99% of the blocks, the data blocks, are actually identical, the same block. And each of these environments changes little bits and pieces here and there, but not that much. So, somebody had the bright idea. Well, maybe there's another way to approach this. Maybe we could share all the duplicate blocks when these copies, these different environments, make changes. Those changes stay private to that environment. Now, how do we do that? There's a lot of technologies that have been out there, actually, what's called file system snapshotting. Now, it started, it's actually been out there 20 years, but uh, presently interesting recently. It was 30 years after the uh, Wright Brothers flew that actual commercial airline started. It took 30 years before people started really profiting off what air flight. So this stuff's been out for 20 years, but people really haven't profited that much. But if you have EMC, you can make snapshots. Um, EMC is so limited on symmetrics on 16. If you have NetApp, you can turn it five, getting better. If you have ZFS, you're unlimited, so it's pretty cool. And plus, it's open, it's, uh, it's open source. DXSFS is the file system we use. We sort of originally had ZFS, and we modified it for data copying purposes. Uh, on the right, I said some of the new flash storage, they come with uh, snapshotting technologies. But um, the snapshot itself is just what I call the fuel. What we want is basically some of that continuous integration. We want the DevOps of cloning. So why isn't the snapshot the car? So there's two problems. Tech, te one's technical and one's bureaucratic. So first is the bureaucratic one. I've talked to shops that use NetApp. They take these file system snapshots and they make their data environments cloned off the snapshots. And the first shop I went into, um, I was like, all excited. I was like, how long does it take you to create an environment? And the guy, I was thinking like, you know, I think 20 minutes, four minutes, I don't know, something fast. And the guy's like, four days. And I'm like, Why does it take four days? And the guy's like, well, you have to like submit a work request and that goes to somebody who accepts it or declines it. If it's accepted, it goes to the DBA, DBA talks to the system admin, system admin talks to the storage admin. And as it goes through all these people, it ends up taking several days. Also, it took me a little while to wrap my head around why does it even take several days? Because each step should be pretty quick. And this is a chart from Phoenix Project. But the idea is, um, something that took one hour when the guy's like 50% idle, uh, it gets up to 9% idle, it might take him a day. It gets up to like 99% idle, it might take nine days. Now, good guy's busy. Yeah. So the DBA and the storage admin. Well, in-house, IT operations, how busy are they generally? Really pretty more busy than more work than they can they can actually do. So it sort of makes sense that these data cloning environments take a long time, even with cool technology. Now that was a bureaucratic problem. The technical problem is if I have some uh, source uh, production system running and it's got its data that I want to snapshot. Um, if this is on like EMC or NetApp or something, it's pretty easy easy to take a snapshot. And once I have a snapshot, it's not that far to mount that over, say, fiber channel NFS onto a target machine, a developer's machine. And then developers start working on their snapshot. But the problem here is that developer's going to be sharing the same spinning disks as production. I mean, how many people are going to allow that? The whole point of making copies is to get away from production because production's where we're making our revenue. That thing goes down when we lose tons of money per minute. The other thing would be if target B is seeing what's working here. After they, all this is created, they need a new copy. You know, there's only one snapshot that they can base off of. Right? They created one snapshot, and they're pretty close from that. If they want something that's newer, uh, more recent copy, they have to take another snapshot that's a full copy. So, so the solution to that would be, what we actually want to do is have our production system and somehow copy that data over here to what we call maybe a development system. And there we take our snapshots. But there's a couple of hurdles there. Um, one, if we just take an original snapshot, just like Tim was saying, 
Well, say that's yesterday. Well, say today somebody needs a copy of today's database. Well, then I can bring off a whole new copy. It sort of keeps the whole purpose. So we need some way, ideally, we want some way to keep the base version in sync with the source version. And here's what the car would be, ideally. I have my source system over here. I want some automated way to first copy it over to this development system that has snapshots on it. And then I'd want to keep, pop, keep copying all the changes so I don't have to make, take a whole full copy again. And ideally, like a time window. So I have maybe a couple of days here that I can spin phones up within that window and purge data outside of that window. Cool. So this has to have snapshots on it so I can take these things home. It would be quite nice if we could do compression. It would be nice if it not only stored data on disk but also in cache, just like a fire. And then, sort of the really important part is self-service is self provisioning. I want some way where somebody can just hit a button and say, I want this production environment on this development box. So I need a provision here. If I need a mount over NFS or fiber channel. And if it's a database, I need to be able to mount and recover and name that database. And if I'm going to give that kind of power out, I'm going to need some self-service. I'm going to need logins, roles, and security. So how would I, how would I create this? So you have, if you want to tackle this, and I think it's worth tackling, there's a number of ways to tackle it. So you, here's the three steps that I've seen in my mind. Source system has to link to some store, store the snapshots, and then I want some way to self-service copies of that environment. So EMC has snapshots. They have a thing called SRDF, which will replicate just the changes from one file to another. You're still missing the provisioning part. Same thing with NetApp. And then I might make snapshots and then I'll actually propagate the changes from production to development. Snapshot manager for Oracle, snapshot manager for Super Server. Oracle has a thing called M12C where they will provision databases, but they, they require that you get NetApp or ZFS. And then they actually don't have any way to sync these two, but you can put it together yourself using something like DataGuard. It's a way of syncing uh, one database in one system to store another system. There's a company called Actio that's a solution that will do all this full stack. They're hardware based. And then Delphix is software based, does the full stack. So those are ways you could approach it. Now, ideally, we want more than just those snapshots. We want to do what we call data supply chain. I want a way to make data flow through the system, flow from production to development to QA to UAT, and maybe back to production. And then we're going to want things like masking, because there's a lot of data in production I don't want the developer to see. Uh, and then on security, who has access to this, these, all these copies we're making, who has access to it? You might have to change security, chain of custody. Definitely want self-service so people can do it themselves. Pick the DBA, storage admin, and how to record them. Um, if I'm going to have developers, you're going to want things like data versioning. So we have source control for source. How about data control for data? And then for auditing, I want things like live archive, where I can go to a previous point in time quickly. And ultimately, what I want to do is I want a continuous integration. I want some developers to be able to, I want to stop a bunch of copies of the production environment for developers. I'd like to get every developer's own copy ID so they can work as fast as they want. And then I'm going to want to be able to branch those quickly to QA. Maybe I do that once a day for continuous integration, run tests on these QA copies. And because these are sharing storage, they're low in resources. I could spin up a bunch of copies. And then we just keep this iteration going. And then another thing cool is, maybe I've talked to a lot of shops that have multiple versions of their application being worked on at the same time. Well, we can all be sharing basically most of the data from production. So I can have version 2.6 of my application using the same data as version 2.7. It's separate. So I don't know how Actio works, but I can tell you how Delphix works. And I think we're the only two companies that do the full stack. But basically, Delphix is software if it's on USB, it installs on any uh, x86 hardware. It, install, it supports full automation, like point and click in a web browser for these databases. DB2, is, we have customers trying to use it, but you have to do some wrapper and run scripts around it. And we'll also do any data, file system, binary, thin phone. <clears throat> Once Delvis is installed on the x86, you give it some storage. The cool thing is it doesn't matter what storage is. It could be just a, it could be JBODs, because we'll map our own file system onto it that does the snapshots. 
The cool thing about that too is it allows us allows us to use any flash system. I don't know who's going to win the flash market. So mm -hmm. it might be nimble one day and pure the next, or extreme IO from EMC the next. So once we have once we have the software installed, runs in the VM under VMware, or runs in AWS, we can store this line. Then we point it to a source system. If there's databases on there, we'll find the databases. You can say, I want to link to a database. When I link, we do a one-time full copy, never do it again. And that copy is compressed by one-third onto the storage. And the, probably the coolest part, though, is from that point onwards and forever, we cut just the changes from that source. So whatever data gets changed here, we pull in the change data blocks and build up this time window. And we can spin up a clone anywhere from within that time window. I don't know how de technical we want to go tonight. So there's a little bit on the file system. Is this getting too technical? Do you want to go into the file system? or you it's, it's how copy on write file system. OK. So this is, this, this is the interior structure of the file system that gets mapped on the disks that are given. So these gray blocks are data blocks, and these are metadata blocks. So these, instead of being forced to be continuously laid out on disk, they can be laid out anywhere. And the metadata will tell us where the blocks are that make up the file. So, if this was the initial link to a database, and these are the blocks that make that database, and then we pull in some, we found some new blocks that are changed, so B got changed and C got changed, we bring in those blocks and that we put them in the file system. So, when we hook them in, no blocks ever get overwritten. This is the cool part. So, this metadata block that points to the data blocks, it doesn't get overwritten. We allocate a new one that points to the new blocks. And it goes all the way up to the Uber, the top block, the Uber block. Now, this is a really cool thing. Is if I give you this beginning, this root system, root block of the file system, you point to the past. If I give you this block, you point to the current. So that I can give you a point in time version of the file system within, you know, sub-second. So if I want to purge, I try to purge that old version so we can have a time window. I just get rid of the blocks that were associated with that previous root block. So now, what if I want to give you a copy? I just copy that root block and I give it to you. And immediately you've got a pointer to the file system at a point in time. This is a new copy. I can I'll get a second copy instantaneously. And what if I try what if I try to change something? So say this guy tries to change some block. Sorry. So he changes the block I. Well, that doesn't not that's an interfere with any of the other copies of the file system. His point is that block by the chain. So then I can give you copies of the file system, give them instantaneously. You can modify your file system, it doesn't include anybody else's files. So, what does this do to our dev development QA environments? So, before, if I had these three copies, you know, dev, QA, UAT, or something, and they're all full physical copies, you know, being stored on some uh, NAS or SAN, in the virtual world, those three copies would come into what we call a data virtualization appliance. Behind the scenes, there's only one copy, and we're all sharing it. Anybody that modifies the block, that block is kept private to that copy. So, so this is our, our, what we typically see in the industry architecture. Very complex and heavy, takes a lot of people. It goes from this to this, where I have the source production being compressed, kept here. In a time window, I can spin up a copy anywhere within this time window. Not only do we keep block changes for the source, we keep block changes for any of these virtually called virtual copies that can make. So, how does this change our life? So, three areas development. The only one we care about the most is development QA, but also impact production support and business. So, for development, we'll have unlimited copies basically, full size, and we can give self service to developers. So now it's easy. So I've got the source database and into the database virtualization appliance, and then I can spin off these copies basically a couple of minutes up on this new storage. So before, where we had a bunch of developers sharing one copy of the database, and if they wanted to make this schema <laughs> change, <laughs> so VDB is what we're calling like a virtual database, a virtual data. Also called V files. Yeah. 
So instead of people wanting, if they want to change schema, waiting a week for a code review, now I can give them all their own copy that can work as fast as they want. <laughs> And these copies, they're for all intents and purposes, they're full size copies. So those bugs that happen because of subsets don't want to you catch them before they get to production. It's not true to be And then the one of the cool parts is self service. I and mean, one of the goals of DevOps is uh, automating and giving self service. So I can give, instead of a developer submitting a work request asking like, what's your boss, if what he did, system out and sort that one, he can just hit a button in a web browser. Now, depending on what side of the fence you're on, that might. Strike joy in your heart or strike fear in your heart. Most uh, DBAs I talk to are like, oh my god, you can't do that, you don't want to do that, they would go crazy. But I mean, the idea is like, get them out of your hair. Like, these things don't take up any storage, and also I can limit what they can do. I can limit how many copies they can make, I can limit, uh, if they do modify data that is stored, so I can limit, and they could take a lot of storage, but I can limit how much storage, so you can only change this much data. And then I can have a chain of uh, custody, so I can see that access to what limit. And it's all it's, it's it's all a progression. I mean, somebody could have written this this uh, system, this this software earlier. But the thing was, is that it's all about spending authority. Because if a developer, you know, if if creating a new environment requires the spending authority of a vice president or the director of IT, then you're certainly not going to have self service truly be something that the developer just goes in and points and clicks. But when provisioning the environment, you know, spinning up a virtual server costs nothing spinning up virtual data costs nothing, then finally it, it is actually okay for people to actually use the self-service uh, application that you built for them. And so I think the impact is bigger for QA. So for QA, we're getting fast environments, parallel environments, uh, build rollback environments, and do destructive testing over and over and maybe. So and one of the big comments I hear about is like, uh, we mentioned earlier is like it takes a long time to build a QA environment. Uh, if I have a development team, they finish uh, maybe their nightly, I ideally want continuous integration, but more typically they finish the sprint and want a QA, then I could build a copy of whatever data environment development is using and give it to QA, and it takes a long time. Well, now with the data virtualization, so developers have branched off from the timeline and the data virtualization line, so they're working on it, they've made some changes. I just branch, it only takes a few minutes, I branch and then I and QA has a copy. I don't have to wait at all. And because they don't take any resources, I can get a bunch in parallel. I'm not stuck with one single QA resource. And then if I'm running a destructive test, um, I can spin off a QA database. Run, uh, maybe I do some setup. Maybe I do masking. Maybe I don't know, walk some accounts. I do a different type of setup. Um, and then I run my destructive test. I don't have to go rebuild it. I can, just get, I can uh, refresh right back to where I finish my setup and run the test over again. So the app stack. And then A-B testing. I, I'm a, I spend a lot of my time with performance. I've always wanted to try this test, I want to try that test. And, um, like maybe I want to, I, don't, I think the database in production would be faster without that index, but I can't call in the production. I'm really not that interested in going in production and dropping it, but I don't have a copy I can play on it, and now I do. Now I can add an index, drop an index, make some modifications, mm -hmm. and compare the performance between different versions. And then we, now we have data version control. So if um, we produce the version 2.1 of the application and basically shut it down, now we're working on 2.2, but then a bug comes on 2.1 and it's urgent, um, and I need to go back to 2.1 environment and fix that bug. Typically before, it'd be a lot of work to create that environment. Well now I have this time flow and I can bookmark grab these dots so we can say that's a point on my key. I can go back to that point, spin up an environment in a few minutes and have the developer start working on my bug fix. So that was all development QA, but this, and that's probably the stuff I'm interested in the most, but this stuff carries on the other parts of the company. So for production support, uh, it helps with backups, recovery, frameworks, migration, and validation. So one of the, I think it's, I mean, again, I can only do your backups, so backups are a big thing in my neck. Uh, I'm scared. Uh -uh. They, they take a lot of space, they're critical, and I don't get to test them very often. Oh, with data virtualization, say I had a nine terabyte database. So this is the size of the database. This is a 30 day range. In, in uh, the Oracle world, the recommended backup practice is first take a full backup, and then all the days to incremental, the changes can be good. And the next weekend, over the weekend, when you have some time, low usage, take a full backup again. 
So if I kept a month of backups with their standard practice, and I'm taking quite a bit of space, with data virtualization and compression, that nine terabyte database would be three terabytes. And then this, this is one terabyte of change per day. That one terabyte of change would only be a third of a terabyte of change. So it's not until I hit like week three and a half where I'm actually at the size of the original database. And I, I can spin up a copy anywhere within that time range. So it's much more efficient and it's easy. It only takes a few minutes to spin up a copy. So this is happening at, I don't know how many of our hundred customers we work with, but somebody on production does something wrong. Like classic case here locally. Podcast, yeah. uh, debate drop movie title table. So they have 26 million streaming movie viewers. They couldn't rent movies because there's no movie title. Um, they have a uh, uh, failover for, well, changes go straight, directly into failover immediately. We want to kind of extend, extend as much as possible. So then the other option is go to backup, which takes about eight hours to recreate from backup. Well, they just actually they haven't even bought a product yet, but uh, they bought it in two days earlier. They already had linked it. It took them uh, a few minutes to spin up a copy before, so we have this time flow. Spin up a copy before they brought the movie title table, spun it up, and then exported it and imported it back into production. And this is something I didn't think about until I started working with customers. But they're like, one of the cool things we think it's cool with data virtualization is we'll have a bug in production that only lasts for a little while. It seems to be related to the data sets, but we don't want to develop it on production. And by the time it comes down the next day, the effort it would take to build production as it was during that problem time is just not worth the effort. And we're just like, so we just live with the bug. But with data virtualization, since it only takes a few minutes to spin up a copy, I, next day when I come in the office, I can go back to whenever that problem is happening in production, spin up a copy, and give it to the developer, and they can start working on that bug. And then this is sort of the other side of the point of uh, backup. What about developer environments? Oftentimes, I say 50-50 development environments don't get backed up. Like, I was just in development environment. You're not in tier one, tier one gets backed up, and you're in tier three, and it's not backed up. Well, who's more likely to screw something up? And, you know, production DBA or developer doesn't like the database for that. Developer. And I'm like, well, DBA, I dropped this table, I didn't even drop down, drop this other one, can you get back to where I was? And the answer is no. Well, now, if, in the virtual database, it's sort of a pretty good benefit. They get pulled into the time flow as well. So if something goes wrong on the developer's database, then I can spin a copy up before that problem happens, throw away the old copy, and I get all the changes that were in that copy up until the point where it goes wrong. So this is getting some bigger concepts, but what about data center migration? If, um, we want to move from one data center to another data center. This S stands for like the source production, like C for phone. It's going to be a lot of work to copy all that from one data center. Another. In the virtual world, I put double sort of that's another way to virtualize it. This would be the source, this would be the virtual copies. If they're all in the data virtualization appliance, basically this could be smaller than the actual source database because it's all compressed. And if anybody's sharing that compressed version, I'm basically moving one, maybe less than one size, one version, one copy of the original database. So it's here, I can move five, or, or 12, or 30, or how many copies you have. So it makes data center. Consolidation or migration elements. And then consolidation, if um, I have a bunch of databases, and this happens out there, like if I get a database, and someone gives me a database, and maybe I use it for the project, I don't let it go, I might need it, I'll never get it back. So we have all these data environments sprawled out over the IT department, and people are holding on to them, but they're not going to use that much. But we're getting charged, like by oil, we're getting charged by core count. What if I could move those all together? Well, in the virtual data world, it's easy to move things together. I just shut, I can just, since all the data on the database virtualization funds, I can shut them down on one target, start them up on another target, and install it all the data easy on the one target. I get charge less. And then a final area it helps is business intelligence. So, ETL jobs, uh, gives access to simple data, confidence testing, federal data. So a lot of times we run ETL jobs at night where we want to extract, extract things from load. We want to run it in a low uh, usage on production site. But then our data sets grow. A lot of times these ETLs outgrow their time for not in batch job and fail. When we go to a global economy, there might not be any batch windows except maybe the weekend. Um, and when I'm running these ETLs, often I'm stressing the infrastructure, pulling all the data across. 
But in business, what if I miss a 90 batch, what if 90 batch talk? If I'm doing it daily, the next day the date is going to be a couple of years old. If I'm doing it weekly and it's a weekend batch problem, I'm going to be two weeks old. Well, data virtualization, I don't have to touch the production database. I just go to the database the relational clients. I can spin up a copy of production as it was a couple minutes ago. So basically give me 24 by 7 access when you tell I no longer have time in it. And also I'm just going to change it. So. And then one of the cool things is depending on the perspective, developers have been asking this for ages. Like, I want access to data as it was at certain points in time. Um, if I ran this query yesterday, what data would they give me? What would they give me the day before? Well, data has never really given that kind of support. It's not full fledged support. Well, with virtual data, I can spin up copies every day for the last month and then run those queries on those copies and get temporary data. I don't, know if, I don't know if you've ever had one of this. If you had to change like a big reporting job, but I'm not quite sure if that report change I made was correct or not, um, how do I QA that? Well, one thing I can do is I can go run that report the way uh, in the day before data and compare it to the previous report. Did it change? Does that give me the correct results? And I can go back and do 30 days and compare it to the previous 30 days reports. And it doesn't prove my report change is correct, but at least it gives me a sense of confidence. It's confidence. And I think it's the final area. A lot of times, uh, our application depends on multiple databases, and it's called federated. So I have an application that uses multiple databases, and when I want to put that into development, I want to get a copy of each of those databases at the exact same point in time, which would be really hard. But in the virtual world, I can link to a source, one source at one week, I can link to another source another week, it doesn't have to be the same week. Once they're all, once they're both linked into the database for the additional client, I can spin up copies down to the second, and have them both at the same point in time. So one example of this would be done. Informatica, they had a project where they wanted to consolidate six databases. So an application that used six different databases. Each database had a different uh, company, uh, customer information on it. Each database was run by a different DBA team. And uh, they projected 12 months to do this, mainly because it was so hard synchronizing all the different teams to get the data at the exact same point in time. But I went to database visualization. And they were able to cut that in half. They did it in six months. But the CIO, who was Tony Young, he said, I felt like a hero. He said, I brought the, I brought the project in half the time, brought in more revenue, invested that revenue in innovation. And he actually won, he won a reward from the entire research institute for that project. Oh, yeah, final thing. And auditing. This uh, time flow, Depending on what, what the requirements are, it could be, by default, in our world, it's 30 days, but it could be three years if you want it to go longer. And I can bookmark certain important points in time. So our auditing is really, really important, especially like in the world of financials. If I'm upgrading financials, I may have no way to go back to that previous and to find auditors. But with this, I can just bookmark it. I can get back to that point in time in a few minutes. So just to summarize, so we go to data virtualization. It allows us to improve application development and QA, also it supports the production support and also improves the business. And we've worked with a bunch of Fortune 500 companies by doing the data virtualization. We've seen them double their application development output. So the other things that we've seen is some fast planning for quality. One interesting thing is on Facebook, before the IPO, they're taking 21 days of the funding for close. So they, they couldn't IPO with 21 days funding for close. Um, they had to get it down to a couple of days. They brought in data virtualization. But one of the reasons they had the problems is they had so many different revenue sources and they ran so fast. They had to consolidate into a single general ledger and they kept getting accounting discrepancies. They needed copies of these different databases and needed to go change things on them in one report to make sure they coordinated. And using data virtualization, being able to have all these copies, allowed them to go from 21 days down to two days. But uh, also faster business intelligence structures, surgical copy like cloning data. Uh, putting back in the direction of the back of the and faster projects. So it's on the quotes. This is the same thing. I see this running hand in hand with um, Agile and DevOps. As a, you know, if you look at some of Gene Kim's presentations, he's done research on how much improvement he's seen in shop for DevOps. These are some of the customers we've talked to with data localization. For projects, New York Live said their projects have been four months to six months. Presbyterian Health said their projects went from 50 days and down to 23. State of California, so I can't imagine what you're out of. Yeah. So, this is the sort of uh, 
moral of the story is like instead of being shackled down by this moment of bureaucracy and heavy infrastructure, you know, put a jet back on and run to us. So what we've seen is that is a constraint. This is what we saw with Gene Kim and the Phoenix Project. Uh, this new report came, a couple of reports came out last week with uh, DevOps consultancy said the number one problem we've seen is getting environments. The number one problem environments is supplying data to so good. The solutions are virtualize the data. Um, and the results we've seen are half the time for projects, higher quality, and the bottom line we want to do is increase the revenue for our companies. Yeah. Any questions on this? It's kind of a fire hose. So. Um, they said people are coming in at seven, so it's like. Are you serious? Oh, we could have gone slower. Yeah. Do you mean like what's impact on IO latency? Yeah. Um, in our in our particular architecture, is like no, that particular thing has no impact on IO latency. It has a beneficial impact. I mean, you think about it. It's the old trade-off between CPU and IO. Compression takes up CPU, but it reduce it reduces the size, the number of blocks you're going to be accessing, makes all the blocks denser, so you're doing less IO. It's a very good trade-off. We have had folks asking us to turn off the compression so they could test it without, and um, it's not a good thing. You know, they say, well, space is not an issue. We're going to take you know, take it without the compression, and uh, they don't get any benefit from that. They have to you know, have less dense data inside the appliance, and uh, you know, they end up spending more I/O. One of the cool things I think and this this doesn't apply to the other data virtualization, but for our particular virtualization, we share not only on the disk but in the memory. So, if I have like ten clones working off the same data set on our storage then it's also not only is it shared on disk, but it's in memory. So if I have, like, say I have 128 gigs of data that I want to share, uh, once that's loaded in memory by one of the clones, all the clones benefit from that cache. So it's sort of like super cache. And that, that's the, the opposite side of, of, you know, an availability issue. I'm going to say, wait a minute, I've got this one appliance that's feeding 20, 30 development environments. What if that one appliance goes down? Yeah, 20 or 30. Development environments go down, but that just makes now that appliance, you know, needs production quality. Are they coming? <laughs> okay, it just needs production quality. Uh, We've got food also, third time. Data should. protection. Those yeah, we could bribe them with food. Maybe. So, like everything else in computing, you know, all that better caching, you know, because everything is more compact and reused by so many different. Environments um, it has a reverse side as well. Hey, sorry. Yeah. I know. Okay. Um, before we go, I want to thank you all for signing in. Uh, just a number of colleagues, you have to take it over to the Lloyd Avery on the Yeah. Um, of course, this project was a good way. Uh,